Good morning, everybody who's just joining. Um, I can see there's still a few more people um, signing in, so we'll give it a, give it a minute or two, and then we'll get started. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, the audience it seems to be gathering now. Um, welcome to this UKRI Net Zero Week webinar, uh, which is focusing on sustainable materials for the construction sector. Um, as Challenge Director for the Transforming Foundation Industries Challenge, um, what the construction requires in terms of materials in the future uh, and the sustainability needs around that, I think it's absolutely clear that it's of vital importance to the foundation industries and the supply chains that run into the foundation industries and obviously on into the construction sector. We've all an awful lot of work to do. The foundation industries and their materials have been a key part of our society for decades and indeed centuries. Um, I'd be interested to hear if anybody's got any different views to the following, but as far as I'm concerned at the moment, I think they're all going to be a critical part of our material needs as we reach 2050. And therefore it's vitally important that we can continue to drive their sustainability over the coming decades so that they're delivering at absolutely what sectors like construction need going forward and not just um, in the long term in 2050, but right along the curve between now and then. And innovation is going to play a vital, you know, vitally important part of that. And we need to look at how that's going to happen and what it needs to deliver on the various timescales. So that was just a very brief introduction from me. Um, Andrew, who's led the work on a recent report in this area, is now going to outline um, the findings. Andrew will introduce himself um, and obviously the report. And then our panelists today, Alison, Matt and Michael, will introduce themselves, give their perspectives on the report. And once we've done that, will answer questions that have come through the chat. So please put your questions um, in the chat. I will do my best to track them, note them, um, and bring them to the floor and to the panel at the latter part of the sessions. So with that, I hand over to Andrew and look forward to hearing all about the report and its findings. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. You just need to put your slides into slide for you, Andrew. Okay. Is, is that okay? Um, I think it's just thinking about it. <laughs> your screen may have frozen. Okay, still no, still no joy. No, is it in slide view at your end? It's in, it's in a presenter view at this end, but I'm 
So we've just got the, um, it looks like it's just trying thinking, still thinking about it. Okay, worked, for, worked fine in the run through. <laughs> <laughs> Almost the way. If you just stop sharing your screen a moment and then just try yeah, it. Yeah, let's try it again. That's it. That's great. Thank you. Ah, brilliant. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the thanks for the intro introduction, Bruce. I'm uh, I'm Andrew Dunster. I'm uh, in the um, construction and environment team at BRE, and we were commissioned by UKRI to do this study back uh, earlier this year. Um, so I'm just going to run through uh, the uh, the research that we did and the findings and and how we went about it. Doesn't, doesn't seem to want to change slides. Ah. Okay, can you see uh, the next sli the slide now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, Dex. Right, thank you. Um, yeah. So as, as I said, we we uh, undertook this research the UK RI, and we were asked to uh, well address this big question really: what the what the construction industry will need from the foundation industries in terms of materials, products, data, et cetera, over the next 30 years, um, trying to focus on the bigger transformational opportunities for the industries and their supply chains. So to do the research, but also to, to kick off a dialogue between the construction industry and, and the foundation industries. And the, the presentation, first I'm gonna speak about the, the BRE research and then illustrate what we found uh, through a few examples of innovations on site and projects to illustrate what we what we found and then um, to finally to talk about the outcomes of the research and what came out of a, of a industry workshop that we did back in March with uh, the stakeholders. So uh, we're very much asked to, to kind of look at the, the issues from the construction industry point of view. Um, foundation industry over the next, or foundation industries over the next few years will obviously have its main drivers like low carbon, um, costs, resource efficiency, and so on. Um, the construction industry will have its needs, other things like quality, um, less construction waste, better predictability of time, cost, control of cost, um, things like that, and new ways of working. So it's trying to look at things from the, the construction industry's point of view, um, what they'll need from foundation industries. And we focused, um, well, we, we looked across the, the whole supply chain from the, the foundation industries, the uh, steel fabricators and so on, right down through uh, um, through the product manufacturers and clients. Um, we focused on particular materials that have a big impact and a big use in the construction industry. And we, we picked those informed by a, a report called the Construction Industry Mass Balance. So we, we, we focus more on cements and ceramics and bricks and glass, which are the big ones, um, and less so on, on chemicals, but we did, we did consider chemicals as well. And we've considered across um, the construction industry from including infrastructure, housing, and commercial developers, designers, and contractors, and um, construction product manufacturers, and all these different materials as, as well. So the, uh, the research has been quite, quite wide, wide ranging. Um, well, um, our methodology for the research, we, we conducted one-to-one -one discussions with some key contacts from BRE and from Constructing Excellence. We've been working closely with Constructing Excellence on, on all of this, um, both in the construction industries and the foundation industries. 
as I said, focusing on what the construction industry needs. Um, we also did some, some web-based research looking at industry websites, and we then checked and validated that by having an industry workshop back in March. Um, and the focus of our discussions really were things like pro product needs, um, information and data, and ways of working, and things of, things of that nature. And that's culminated in a, in a quite a long, well, it's quite a long report. It's got a very punchy front end to it, but then information and appendices at the back with the results of the research and of the, and the workshop. And the kind of innovation needs that we turned up during the research were, well, things around construction process, things around materials, design optimization, bringing together materials and combination of, of materials in clever ways, ways of working through digitization, business models, etc., and also the circular economy. And I'll say a bit more about those those different things now through these examples um, so the, the first example is um, a concrete steel um, structure there's there's a lot of interest in in publications and in, the, and in the industry on bringing together the best of materials and not just having a concrete building bringing bringing together materials in the round and making the best of best of their unique attributes and this this project is represented by two office blocks in London, uh, which is a hybrid steel and concrete construction, um, which is consisting of a steel frame and then a, a composite system called Comfloor, where um, with a, a permanent steel deck acting as permanent formwork for, for concrete. Um, so the whole thing working in the round is um, using less steel, less concrete, and it's also fitted out with reversible bolted connections to give the um, ability to embrace the principles of circular economy to reclaim at the, at the end of life. But it's the hybrid design here that's the, the, uh, the clever thing. Okay, and a, a further example, this is more of a, um, a demonstration project funded uh, in part by government called the ACORN project. And this, this is using an arched, um, structure to um, utilize the concrete more in compression so thus use less concrete also an adaptable mold that can be reused and fabricated with a sprayed concrete um, system so using less less concrete reversible connections as well for circularity and with that it's claiming 60% uh, less embodied carbon than the equivalent flat slab so you can see the uh, floor is arched and then there's a raised floor above that and then a steel frame. Now this example is around windows. Um, yet another, uh, another building in London, an existing structure where the, the, the seals on the cladding around the, around the seals around the glass and the cladding had reached the end of its service life. Um, but the glass was, was still in good condition. So a local pop-up factory uh, was set up when the building was being refurbished. And the uh, locally to the site, the, the existing glazing panels removed, clean, fitted with new gaskets, and then put back in. And it reflects these differences in service life, but the glass has a long service life, it is less so. Um, but this is moving in a more circular economy kind of direction. Fourth example is um, Project Hyperpile, which is a um, combined multifunctionality. So it's board piles for deep foundations, but the, the piles are hollow um, and have a different surface uh, to a normal pile. So hollow, they use less material, they use a low carbon concrete, and they've also got um, energy and environmental control systems integrated into them. Um, and the pile service design increases the bearing capacity. So it's sort of optimized for design, um, material saving, and also multifunctionality. 
And then I think this is the, fi the final example. This is yet another demonstration project around uh, reusable cassettes, um, steel frame that manufactured as sub assemblies with, with clever digital engineering to make the best use of the materials, reusable the end of life, and using the, the, the best elements of the steel and the concrete, reducing the weight of the frame and the structural steel delivering labour, things like that. Okay, so, so now uh, wrapping up with some of the, the, the findings of the research, um, the overall conclusion really was, is that the construction industry will expect new ways of working and processes, um, materials and performance meeting environmental KPIs and data requirements and designs so it's um yeah i think uh, low carbon will be sort of a, as taken as red but the, the the foundation industries will need to partner more with the with the construction industry in terms of process materials and data needs and design um so these are a few findings that came out of the uh, the research yeah so circular economy will become more significant and materials will need to be compatible with this and foundation industry will need to work with the industry construction industry to, to make that happen. Um, training and skills will be more digital, um, more off-site construction, which is starting to come through already, less craft skills and upskilling to cope, cope with greater choice, um, particularly in the world of cements to get low carbon um, alternatives, the world of cement and concrete is much more complicated and, and people will need to understand the, you know, the, the, where these different cements can be used and not used. Um, and design skills and support for hybrid structural design as well. And I think a lot more partnering and collaboration throughout the supply chain in order to achieve the above. The materials perform and performance um, as materials costs and availability become more uncertain. Um, use of less materials has an added benefit that's low carbon as well, less materials. So more effective and careful use of materials, getting the best out of the materials I think will be key. Um, increasing recycled content, I know a lot of foundation industries are focused on that and um, using byproducts from other industries to reduce their primary uh, material use. And for the construction industry, um, getting better quality longevity uh, from the materials and the components, longer life, being able to refurbish and things like that. And multi-functionality multi as demonstrated by the multi, the, the uh, hyperpile, you've got structural effects, you've got uh, other things built into it as well. And then data, um, the industry will need, as a matter of course, um, you know, verified carbon savings and lower carbon. And other environmental impacts like water use and minerals extraction. Uh, uh, water footprint is, is being mentioned more these days as well. Um, the robustness of data, good data is needed, I think. And, um, data suitable to go into, into models for design, whole LCA, data from embodied sensors for lifetime monitoring, that's going to become an increasing issue and data needs to be compatible with all of that. And more, more careful time spent on consideration of materials and carbon at the design stage. And then just briefly, um, the, the industry workshop, we had 140 delegates on, online. They went off into discussion groups and then we, we reconvened at the end on the challenges that the construction industry has to, to up to 2050. And we um, addressed particular questions in those. Just a few, a few things that came out of that. They tended to, to confirm what we found in the, in the research. Um, Industry will need lower carbon, robust information, ability to produce, get this low carbon, but also get um, 
similar cost, better performance and durability, which is a bit of an ask, I know, but uh, um, that's, that's been what everyone's aspiring to. Um, performance data for, for design tools was quite important. Quality, uh, circular economy, multifunctionality, things like self-cleaning glass, um, integrated systems, whole life management, um, support for hybrid construction, and new materials, so reinventing old, old materials, perhaps in new ways, bio-based materials, unfired materials and such like. Um, I think we're going to go now straight into the, uh, the, the panel session and then with uh, questions later on. So I'll, I'll hand back to Bruce uh, for that. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, that was great. Um, as we can see, um, an awful lot to go at, um, a lot to, for the, the, the pan panellists to, to consider. Uh, and I'll be very interested to hear their perspectives on um, both what you've said broadly and, and the most important things and how the findings here fit within the, the wider jigsaw of where we think the construction uh, industry is going in terms of its materials needs as we go forward. Um, so on that, Alison, could I ask you um, to introduce yourself um, and give some thoughts from, from your perspective? Okay, thank you. I'm Alison Nicholl and I'm Head of Constructing Excellence here at BRE. So I work alongside Andrew and I was working alongside Andrew on some of the stakeholder engagement around this. What surprised me was actually the level of interest from the construction industry in this. Um, there's a real recognition within construction that they need to change. The, the just the how to make that shift isn't quite there yet. There's a lot of things that need to be in place around the commercial models that allow people to take forward innovation, to take forward um, things like these new ways of working, etc. I think robustness, reliability, assurance that those products are going to work and perform in the way that the way they um, that the traditional products do is going to be really critical to enabling that. I think there, there's a recognition, again, that what we do at the moment just doesn't work and it can't work in the long term. We know we need to change. We know we need to change our supply chain. So circular economy is more important. We know that all of these things must change. I think what strikes me is that there needs to be a lot more collaboration, not just at a project level, but with with that sort of at a more systemized level. And that's where I think MMC has got an opportunity because you're creating those long-term commercial arrangements that can enable these kinds of things to happen. Because at the end of the day, somebody's got to pay for this. And, you know, sometimes innovators kind of innovate blind because they don't quite understand what the construction sector is asking for or who the key decision makers are within the construction sector. And I think that needs that has to change. We've been saying that for a very long time, but I think there needs to be more recognition with those specialists of what they can deliver, what value they can bring. And I think what things like the Value Toolkit, which the Construction Innovation Hub launched recently, will help with that to allow um, to allow material suppliers to understand that line of sight of in terms of what is value and what innovation needs to happen to deliver that value for um, construction sector clients. But I think it's a really exciting time at the moment. But I do think there's a lot of sort of not technical challenges, but commercial assurance, governance challenges that will enable people to make that leap. Yes, there are te technical challenges. There will always be technical challenges, but I think it's the sort of more human factors that are the bit that's holding us back at the moment. No, nope. thank you, Alison. I was just writing down your last point there. Caught me up, caught me on the Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I completely agree um, with, with, with everything you've said. And um, the, the, I think, yeah, there is there is more we can do, and I'm sure we'll discuss it in the, the, the Q&A session um, shortly. So um, moving on, if I could ask um, Michael, could um, you introduce yourself um, and give your, your perspectives? 
Sure. Yeah. Thank you, first of all, for having me. Um, I find this whole conversation really fascinating from many, many angles. Um, so first of all, thanks for that. Um, it's certainly a very impressive body of work. I think it's a very complex area to really get get the grip in terms of you know, who should be at the table. I think what's really great is um, the summary of stakeholders. And I want to get back to this in a moment because I think the stakeholder group is much broader than we would normally assume uh, in thinking about materials. And it really affects every aspect of the value chain. Um, so I'm, I'm representing different heads here. Um, I'm currently in Caltbray Group um, and um, I'm the innovation director. Uh, in a part-time role, but I'm also um, representing uh, different forms of R&D in terms of uh, both industry-led developments and also uh, academic research. And I'll get back to this in a moment in terms of, I think, what needs to happen more in terms of cross-sector engagements and knowledge transfer and so on. Um, so um, there's a few different viewpoints and different angles. And I think one thing that's absolutely key is that we really need to think front to end uh, in terms of uh, design and delivery cycles, and then obviously the end of life conversation, which in construction is still uh, not really fully understood. You know, we, we, we're bringing up the values in terms of uh, reuse and recycling, um, but that really needs to move to the front end where we construct things differently. Um, and that requires probably different material properties. Um, the, the other point is uh, what I mentioned earlier, the, the broad range of stakeholders. So um, that comes from the client side, where I think for a while we've seen a lot of client behavior that is, uh, you know, leaning towards someone's got to give me uh, net zero. I'm not sure what that really looks like or how that works, but we need it. Um, that goes all the way down uh, the supply chain and then eventually ends up in the space of probably academic research, uh, which is sort of bottom up and the SME trying to do uh, uh, new developments, um, but they're up against a really big, big risk. Um, and that risk isn't currently shared enough, I would say. So there's, there's, there's a lot in this whole sort of um, stakeholder conversation that, that I think is, is relevant. And I think Alison alluded on some of that. Um, the other is then, do we really understand whole life cycle um, considerations in terms of full life cycle cost, in terms of full life cycle carbon, embodied carbon versus operational carbon, and how materials play a role in, for instance, optimizing against operational carbon. Um, we just had a lot of conversations with uh, different consultants across the built environment, and it comes through that there's a real gap we need to close. And you know, what does it mean for material use and and uh, extraction of resources and so on. Um, so then there's a few points I wanted to make um, in terms of the different approaches. Um, so we've, you've, you've shown um, the hyperpile, which is a Calpray development, and it's doing an awful lot. Um, I invite you to, to visit the website. There's a brochure that talks about uh, all the efficiencies we're driving. And material is part of it um, because we're using different low carbon materials. We are eliminating steel. Uh, we're cutting out. Uh, in deep foundation systems, 40 to 70 percent of material to begin with, and then because of certain properties that that the hyperpiles have, we can inject renewable energy systems with an increased efficiency and so on. Um, so the, the point I want to make there is that we have to really start with uh, eliminating material use, and that's a design challenge, and and sometimes it's a cultural challenge because we're used to over specifying, and then you know someone else is over specifying, and before we know it in a duplication of efforts, everybody's trying to do the right thing. Um, but we end up with results that are not as good as they possibly could be. Um, the, the other is that we um, have worked in this project, which was Innovate UK funded uh, over a three year period uh, in a really, really good consortium, uh, again, across these different sectors. So we've been working with technology startups, we've been working with material producers, <coughs> working with uh, people in the space of digitalization and data capture. So one of the things, uh, Andrew, you mentioned is that we need data um, to, to process. And the question then is, even if we have data, and a lot of people are fond of big data, um, which I'm always a bit critical of, 
But the question is, what do we measure the data against? How do we process that? And um, what is the outcome of that evaluation process? So part of, part of what happens there uh, is supported by academic research. So we've been working closely with City uh, University of London, and we've uh, adopted some of their early stage concepts. Um, we're, we're doing this in, in different capacity at this point. Um, and I'm also an honorary visiting professor at City. So there's again, trying to link up different uh, different ways of working and what it really needs is an active engagement between them uh, to reach out is, is good but um, I find it very productive to be involved uh, on both sides. Um, the other thing I want to mention when it comes to materials and design and processing is that um, what we see in the industry uh, is, is really headed down the route of offsite manufactured and design for manufacturing and assembly driven approaches. Uh, Andrew Shu. Uh, showed some examples there for demountable building structures. And again, the, the, the manufacturing process in itself becomes really quite meaningful, uh, but it relies on material property. Um, and we're pushing this uh, quite heavily now at UCL, um, where I'm also visiting professor for design for manufacture. And again, it's about bringing, bringing these different aspects together between industry and academic research. And so I, I probably want to conclude with um, the scope um, that you mentioned there, um, and that is over the next 30 years. And there's a few principles that I think are relevant um, in terms of time scales. What, what we see in construction is that people live typically in a, in a project world. Everything's driven by the project and the project um, pays the bills, um, but the project also lives in a world of project-based constraints. And what's important is to decouple um, the innovation work streams and also think about products and, and systems and services and also really, really think hard about process. So that is one of the things why in the industry things are probably moving not at the pace we want to see it because the project constraints are typically overruling uh, process optimization capacity. Um, the other that's quite important is to think about, um, and I think uh, Alison just spoke about this, the, the collaboration aspects. Collaboration and, and co-creation are absolutely key because people do different things and, and then hopefully do it well. Um, but it's really when, again, the overlap happens that, that we get to uh, game-changing developments. Now, having said development, I think there's another thing that is important, which is uh, to develop new materials, virgin materials is fantastic, but there's also opportunities to deploy good materials from other sectors in construction. We're not doing that enough. And there's also um, you know, the idea that we can customize and, and uh, deploy materials that are then modified for construction purposes that are coming from other industries. So I'll probably leave it with that, um, but that's my reflection on the work that was done. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, that was very, very comprehensive. There's many things I think we'll come back to in, in, in the Q&A. Uh, I think we're already seeing um, a, a significant emphasis um, on collaboration, <clears throat> certainly from uh, the Transforming Foundation Industries perspective, where we've essentially said, if you want support from UKRI, you, you've got to work multi-sector. Multi um, our big learning, or one of the big learnings from that, has been that as you do that, you almost naturally start the wider down the supply chain um, collaboration part. Um, and, and yeah, we want, to, we want to see more, more of that, but we'll come back to it in a bit. Um, so I'd now like to introduce um, Matt Comer. Um, he'll say more about where his background is and therefore the perspective of his, his views on the, the findings of the report. Um, and then we'll get into the, the Q&A session. Um, so Matt, over to you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, echoing uh, Michael's point, thank you very much for uh, inviting me on this. My name is Matt Colmer. I'm Senior Innovation Lead for the UKRI Transforming Construction Challenge. Uh, and it's great to see from Andrew's presentation that three out of the five examples that were given were actually funded by the UKRI Transforming Construction Challenge, the Forge, Acorn and Hyperpower, which um, Michael has, has mentioned. And I think that goes to show uh, you know, the way that um, activities such as the, the work that UKI does can really influence this, in this area. The 
the transforming construction challenge was uh had a, a a focus of lower emissions on there and 31 out of the 52 projects that we funded uh through the innovate uk strand so these are business-led projects not the not the academic um or the cih or the uh active building center research projects but the uh the business-led ones were focused on uh carbon reductions and i think this report just shows the diversity of the way that we start looking at materials and how those materials have an impact on the way that people operate and the way that people people work. I think there's the two things that I wanna really pick out on this is there is a friction here between uh, products and services that are being developed using uh, low carbon approaches uh, and uh, materials reduction, uh, materials substitution for, for lower impact materials versus industry thinking there is a friction there and the challenge being is that uh with the with the challenge and it's been uh stated in in the report quite clearly that there is a social value here and we have to move away from procuring and building at lowest cost to procuring and building for better value and this is the social aspect and here you get that natural capital and here you get the uh, um the environmental capital uh, which is really important when you're starting to look at these uh, these materials. And so when you start looking at um, materials uh, reduction, uh, as I said, there's a lot of um, uh, companies that we have funded which have been been doing that. The uh, Acorn was given as an example in the uh, in the presentation, which looked at using parametric design for reducing uh, concrete. Uh, concrete use. We have a similar one for steel, actually, using parametric design to uh, optimize steel construction. And there are other um, activities as well saying, okay, well, um, if you're going to use materials, then you optimize the time and the place that you're using materials. And we see now that there is more AI and more digitization coming in this in the delivery and the supply chain. One of the projects uh, which we've funded uh, called Cloudbox has used um, uh, so AI and, and well machine learning and sensors on the cement truck going to site. So it optimizes the time that that material is actually delivered on site. And so you use less of it. It's the greatest metric I think in the world. It's saying they, they calculate the quality of concrete by the term slump, which I absolutely love that phrase. So it goes on site and you can optimize the time you're using uh, the concrete in order to be able to uh, maximize the uh, the the materials that have been or minimizing materials being used, and then understand what the quality of that concrete is going to going forward. So you can then potentially use it on another site, knowing exactly um, what the quality of that material is. And then the plus sides of that, it's, it then has a, a an impact on delivery times because you can then uh, calculate by looking at uh, the quality of the material plus the weather how that concrete is going to cure and when it's going to be ready for the next stage so you then can optimize all the other impactful um, materials delivery that you're that you're using on site so i think the other the other point as well as we were mentioning about is the uh is the social value and the social value here i think is really 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 important we, again uh alison mentioned the value toolkit which was developed by the construction innovation hub um, which really focuses on how you can start uh, um, in embodying uh, the the principles of uh, lower carbon and lower carbon materials into your value and into your procurement making decisions. And the value toolkit also um, moves into the uh, construction playbook, of course, which is uh, operating through through uh, the government, uh, the government estate at, at the moment. But that's not um, looked at in isolation. There are other uh organizations looking at value one of the pieces of work that we are doing as well is looking at um at social value in uh transport infrastructure and again this is all about optimization of materials it's optimization of time it's optimization of where you are doing things and and um, bringing down the the material cost and increasing those those productivity gains i think some of the challenges that uh we face here is that uh it's the economic climate that we're living in, I think, at the moment, and it's 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 true of all things. Saying you, we are making that uh, the friction against the industry thinking, and as Michael said, we do 
uh, move back to a project-based approach. And it's very difficult to start getting those um, the thinking from one project to then transfer over to another project, to a new project. Take that learning as you're going through. I think the, the point that this rep report makes and the point that both Alison and uh, Michael have made is the, the collaborative approach here is really, really important. It's fundamentally important. And uh, it is, to be honest, the raison d'etre of what we do with UKRI um, is uh, that collaborative approach. We have, you know, we bring the academic pe people together, we bring the, uh, the the businesses together. And I think that the uh, the uptake here is going to be really interesting because, you know, we have come to the end of the challenge now as far as uh, as far as the work that we have done, and uh, we see from the uh, the activities of the partners within the collaborations is that they are continuing to work in this area. They're continuing to take these ideas forward. They're continuing to start um, working collaboratively. They're really, really understanding the point of you know the uh, the trajectory of net zero how it can benefit them, how they can get ahead of the game at this particular time. And it's, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's, uh, it's really important for us to preserve those collaborations and keep working with the, um, the, these organizations going, going forward, because they're the ones that are forward thinking, they're the ones who will start to bring the laggards uh, forward with us and uh, ensure that the, the lessons that we are learning now, we are demonstrating through these this report and uh, and other activities that there are there is a need for complete collaborative thinking across the sector. And there are already products and services being delivered to help on this on this journey. Thank you, Matt. And, and once again, um, so many things um, that I agree with there, and, and, and so many things I think we, we recognise we, we we've got we've got to we've got to tackle. Yeah, um, and, it, and, it, and it's going to be difficult to tackle them all at once, but we've got to certainly try to tackle as many of them as, as we possibly can. Um, so as we go into the Q and A session, um, please uh, keep putting your questions um, in, into the chat. Um, I've picked up two or three already. Um, which I'll, I'll, I'll make use of in a moment. Um, and just to lead into that um, and following on from, from what Matt has said, again, as the Transforming Foundation Industries Challenge, um, we've found that um, collaboration has, has been key. Uh, and, what, and what we're finding is, is that as those collaborations uh, and consortia start to form, people's mindsets and ways of thinking about what they're doing genuinely change. Now, I'm not going to name names, but we recently um, had a fairly large um, uh, competition for demonstration projects. And, and that's gone through and we're going through its process and some projects uh, will be funded and will actually get started. But even during the development process for those projects, one of the UK's largest chemical companies, and indeed they're a global chemical company, came to us and said, do you know what? To a certain extent, it almost doesn't matter now whether we get funding from you out of this competition to do a particular project, because just going through the process of what you've kind of forced us to think about and creating these new collaborative groups has helped us immensely to understand where we need to be going going forward. And, and, and that's one of those impacts that I think as a, as a challenge for me personally, just says that's really what, what we're after. You know, even though the treasury might not find it tangible, for me, it's vital. Um, so I'll ask the, the panelists uh, to, 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 to talk about that mo uh, perhaps more momentarily, but I noticed in the chat um, that Cameron uh, Christie had asked a question about, are we gonna be able to take this forward now? If we take this forward now, is it just gonna be UKRI funding projects? Um, or is the construction sector um, going to step up to the plate and, 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 and contribute for these innovation projects? And I'll ask all the other panellists about that as well. But my perspective from what I've seen so far in terms of running and uh, transforming foundation industries, uh, where there are a lot of construction companies involved, is that through the consortium that we fund, in general, the funding from UKRI tends to be supporting the small and medium-sized companies who are bringing the innovations and are bringing the new the new thinking 
to the sectors and the companies, whether they're within the foundation industry sector, whether they're within the construction sector. Um, and the, the bigger companies are putting in some money in kind so that we're meeting targets in terms of um, overall fund, funding rates. So generally, um, the, 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 those companies in the construction sector are contributing financially to the innovation projects. But in terms of where the money goes from from UKRI, the majority of it tends to go to the small and medium-sized companies to help them bring their innovations through. And um, so that's my, my perspective on that question. Um, could I go to Matt, maybe to follow on? Have you found similar sort of thing as you've been doing the Transforming Construction? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, um, from Transform Construction, we very much support, it's SME focused. They need to have a client involved. So that's when you get the, the larger construction companies. Um, and also for, uh, for a lot of, um, the work that we do is, is based on co-investment. So we track our co-investment figures very, very closely about what we supply as a grant and what other investment happens as a result of that grant, whether it is a whether it's during the project time or whether it's additional um, work that's done to extend the project beyond what we have funded. And that information shows that the industry at large, SMEs and the large players, are very capable and very keen to continue funding in this area they 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 see when it's a good idea they want to in, invest in it and they want to push it forward i think the challenge that we have from ukri's point of view is continuing that momentum so the other thing is not just the money that is provided it is convening that group of people who can who we can support going forward who feel as though that there is this collaboration going and i think when the when the challenges like ours finish is that there is that kind of you know, go off my pretties and fly away. And without that convening, that is the challenge. And this is where the likes of, you know, obviously Construction Excellence, the KTN, and there are other bodies out there that we, you know, that we work with in order to keep that sense of family, sense of convening together in order to push it forward. So it's not just about the money. Alison, do you want to pick up on that point? Yeah, I think it's about creating the environment where people can really understand where each other are coming from, because it's not about the money. So I used to be involved with the KTN when it was separate KTNs and I was built environment. And I didn't realize when I was in that innovation space, just how much commercial models prevented innovation, really logical brilliant ideas from coming through to the marketplace and I think what we've got to remember here is it was a quote somebody said the other week that innovation is easy implementation is hard so actually we need to move forward to implement a lot of these ideas and I think there needs to be a sort of stable environment for that implementation to happen because I think you know, we've got a lot of government focus on net zero, we've got clients focusing on their ESG. So we, it's coming into client requirements. And we need to make sure that that stays there, because that's what's going to give people the confidence that there's going to be that market demand going forward for it, because there was a lot of work done about a decade ago, and then suddenly it all dropped off the radar in terms of that drive for environmental sustainability. And you know, we need that, you need that consistency, you need that understanding that there is going to be a market for this, you know, there will be the early adopters that want to do it because it's the right thing to do. But we do need that consistency to help drive that forward and help that implementation. So these things go from being pilot projects and stuff that, you know, the best in the industry do to something that you everyone does so you know a bit like led light bulbs nobody uses old-fashioned light bulbs anymore so we need to move from using you know portland cement to carbon you know low carbon cement it's just what we do we don't even consider any other options so it's how we get these things from being innovation into that mainstream practice and it, that requires a lot of work, a lot of consistency, and a lot of changing of those models that, you know, the decision making processes, because, you know, it needs to become 
become something that's easy to access, the supply chain's there, they know what they're doing, and just get it through into the mainstream market. Thanks, Alison. And do you want to respond, Michael? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add a few things because I think it's a fascinating conversation. And for, for us being in that space um, to create the environments I think Alison is, is talking about is, is, is terribly exciting, but it's also really, really challenging. Um, and I, I think this idea that innovation is easy and deployment is complex um, can be very misleading to certain people because it seems that you know the the early stage pie in the sky sort of uh, world um, certainly exists in certain industries. Um, it's it's oftentimes quite far from what we are doing, although we like to dream things up and push the bar as far as we can. But we, by default, sort of thing, we are we are quite um, close to reality in many ways. But I'd like to go back to you know it's about the money. It's it's. It's always about the money in any business, but it's I think about uh, what was just said about in terms of market creation. So when we started the Hyperfile project and a few other things we're doing now, the market didn't really exist. Um, but if you think about how we can scan the horizon and see what does exist in terms of crises, what does exist in terms of resource scarcity, and what does exist in terms of energy policy and management, it, it has consequence. And if you just think five, 10 years ahead. And again, you step out of the project constrained world, which is thinking maybe five weeks, maybe five months if you're lucky, uh, or in the five years that it takes to, to get a medium sized building into place. Um, a lot of times, even in those five years, we think five times one year. And that's not getting us into a 30 year cycle. If you think how whole building process takes, let's say five to five, maybe six years on a, on a medium range. If you think infrastructure application, and that's really where massive impact can happen, you're looking at five to 10 years. Um, so you really have whatever, three to four times the project duration to make a difference. And the conversations with HS2 and Crossrail and others are fascinating that way on national highways, you know, where you've got massive material use that can drive significant change. But I wanna go back to the idea of collaboration and co-creation and it is about the money, but um, I think certain things would have happened regardless of Innovate UK funding, and I would think certain things would have not happened. So thanks again for, for being supported here by Innovate UK. Um, but you know, as a large organization and the, the lead organization, the grant, for instance, um, it took a lot of convincing internally that even a 70-30 funding is absolutely worth going after because it, it gets us over the line. Um, and that's one, but the other was to pull in uh, more significantly funded SMEs at 50-50 or the academic partners at 100% funded, um, because it was really that collective and the environment that we created, as, as Alison said, that made the difference. Um, and the really good thing is in, in creating new markets, it made a difference for everybody. It made a difference for us as a large contracting company it made a difference for a, a fairly small at the time technology startup working in digitalization, data sensing um, and, and data processing. Um, and it made a big difference for the academic partners. So the collaboration and the cross sector engagements, they were hugely important. But the other thing related back to the, the time scales is that you know, we live in a, in a short term delivery space. And we need others to help stimulate the construction industry. Uh, and we're doing it here, but the industry at large is a bit slow in adopting it, that we really have to think it to longer term. And, and that's something that is, is just a cultural shift. Um, and that's something we need to come, come to terms with collectively. And maybe the last point is um, in terms of the material use um, that I think we need to do three things. One is develop and deploy, so the innovation part and the commercialization part. Um, but then in, in and during the commercialization, we need to also disseminate and we need to educate. And so that is a big part in educating the clients, uh, de-risking projects, and then basically get to some point of collective learning as an industry, uh, because you know, we need that uptake, we need quantities, um, and the risk is way too high if we don't shift the bar towards the adaptation of, for instance, low carbon materials at scale. 
um, and find the right applications for those, which may not be necessarily building entire buildings of them, but maybe go into smaller applications that can be risked. But yeah, it's 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 huge potential, and it is really exciting to think about those. Yeah. Um, um, oh, I'm echoing. Um, thanks, Michael. I mean, I completely agree with the the, the last point um, about the, the dissemination. Um, Matt outlined earlier um, how much of a priority um, that has been as, uh, from from transforming construction and and trying to get things in place that that will last and and, and be places where people can learn um, about what's been brought through uh, and continue to collaborate. Um, and I notice um, Chris in the Q&A was asking about platforms um, through which these sort of um, connections can be made and um, cooperative groups um, formed. And, and, and I would emphasize that the, the likes of Bree, the likes of Innovate UK, KTN, and some of the bodies that are being created um, by um, Transforming Foundation Industries have been created um, through the auspices of transforming construction um, are, are, are really key to these. Um, and so please have a, have a look out look out for those. Um, I wanted to come to uh, one or two of the wider points within the, 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 the report. Um, and I'm going to start um, with one of the, 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 big, the big questions. Um, and um, forgive me because I'm an ex steel man. This will sound like uh, coming, coming from a from, a, from, a, from a, an ex steel guy, but I think um, it's a question that we always need to address, and, and we need to look at how broadly um, it, it needs to be addressed. We have touched on it already, but I think think there's more to say. So, in terms of materials efficiency, you know, and the whole thing of we 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 basically need to use um, less of all of the foundation industry materials from, 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 from my perspective uh, as we go forward for, 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 many, for many reasons. And, and as I was thinking about this ahead of this, this morning, I wrote, literally wrote down pay for performance in quotes and said, well, what, what, does that, what does that mean in my head? You know, will the construction sector in 2050, it will, ha it will have expectations of all sorts of performance in terms of um, net zero, wider sustainability fact, factors, all the things that we, we've taken into account for the decades and centuries until, in terms of fun, functional performance. So from yourselves as panellists, um, where do you think we are at the moment in terms of um, the, the, the sectors and through the supply chain being able to find the right balance in terms of um, being able to bring forward right versions of materials and that the performance can be delivered at the right price. A big question, um, but one I think that the, these sort of sessions have to touch on at some point. Um, is anybody going to volunteer to go first on that? Michael, thank you. I'll jump in because we have a lot of these conversations currently, and yeah. we're working through, you know, as you do an update to the business case of the hyperpile currently, because we're we're getting some real traction with it, with this exciting but we you know you go through a lot of conversations in terms of back to the idea of creating a market which currently doesn't exist because the capabilities we're creating don't exist um and so the the first question there is you know what measure do we take and what do we measure the efficiencies against um and then the the next thing that is is quite challenging as i said earlier and um we're coming to terms with it and we're looking for support uh, from, from a range of very different um, specialties, if you like, or expertise. That is to think, you know, what kind of performance do we measure how? And um, what, what is the price point we can, we can think of and how do we define price? And there's, there's one thing um, that is quite different and that's thinking of price or value. And so mm -hmm. one of the things we're really pushing hard is to think what is the value creation um, that we propose and that we can deliver, which is different from the, you know, the sort of short-term delivery monetary transactional way of looking at value systems, which is strictly speaking in the pound. 
And so one of the things that's quite interesting when you think, and I want to get back to, I think Andrew said it earlier, the, and, and, and you said it, Bruce, the, uh, the idea of social value systems. And it's eventually about us people occupying the built environment. It's not the other way around. And so, you know, when we deliver uh, more productively and more efficiently and in a leaner way, and we, we save, and we've done this for the hyperpile, we, we save, let's say, 50 to 60% of materials. That inherently doesn't just mean material saving, which equates into 50 to 60% monetary savings. It's not the case because we have to do things to enable those material savings. But what it does is it takes 50 to 60% of material transport off the road. It eliminates 50 to 60% of diesel emissions. It improves air quality. It reduces congestion. It reduces, you know, impact with cyclists, uh, incidents that can be very harmful. It, you know, improves community quality through less noise pollution. So suddenly you think about material savings, and there is a massive knock-on effect. The next thing, then, in terms of community, if you think about design for manufacturing assembly principles, which again in this project are absolutely unique. It's never been done in foundation systems like this before. It gets us to thinking, you know, instead of people traveling across the country to serve a site uh, or different locations, even within and around London, you have a, a safer, you have a better controlled working environment. You drive up efficiencies and a bit like the fourth story, it, it's gonna drive up, um, you know, the value systems for everybody also in monetary terms, because they're, they're probably higher paid jobs longer term. Um, and so again, if you think economy, ecology, social equity, and, and we step back and say, it's not just about delivering this project, there is much more in it. And that becomes a big incentive for literally everybody along that value chain. But we have to think value proposition and not just the cheapest or the best price. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, Alison, did you want to come in? Yeah, I think there definitely needs to be a move away from price as a sort of indicator of, you know, quality, you know, if we go for lowest price, we've got to look at it in the long term, you're not comparing to the right solutions. Um, I think there is, you know, it could be easier to do, you know, a traditional construction methodology as opposed to an MMC based hyperpile solution, but you're not taking into account those wider um, variables. We had a session last week where we were talking with HS2 around um, some of the MMC pro approaches that they're using. And actually, pound for, you know, bit of work for a bit of work it probably would be easier to just say right it's going to, the concrete's going to be cheaper if we go down this route but actually they're minimizing their enabling works they're minimizing the amount of movements around the site they're doing it quicker so they're actually um bringing in more um they're they're doing it quicker so they're minimizing the level of disruption getting the asset out there quicker and into use and also they're minimizing environmental impact and the um hazardous working conditions so there's so much stuff that needs to be taken into account which i think is where things like the value toolkit can be really useful because you're taking that bright broader view of value i think to the point of sort of comparing different materials we need to be really, really careful that we don't let sort of emotion get in the way of actually properly evaluating materials based on data and robust data. Because I think some, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, politics that sits behind a lot of this. There's a lot of, you know, pushing one material over another, and it's not a case that one material is bad and one material is good. Mm -hmm. It's a case of finding the right materials and products to use in the right environment that based on robust decision making and you know careful analysis and planning um so i think there's a long way for us to go before we we get there in terms of these things because sometimes people are just rushing to get the latest new 
whizzy thing and they're not actually thinking about how it's it you know how we've done digitalization is it's a little bit like that we've rushed in and not thought about how we actually change the processes in terms of making you know we're trying to digitally digitalize some quite broken processes rather than thinking about how do we change the processes and what can you know what is the right way to do this and i think the same applies for this whole materials selection piece let's look at how we do things differently not, let's not tr try and retrofit these solutions onto broken systems and processes and ways of doing things let's look at you know ways of looking at the art of the possible mm -hmm. can i just add one point uh to Alison's, um, which is the, the idea of, of use and reuse. And I think, again, if you think of cost models and value systems, um, we're, we're currently developing reuse cases for, for different applications. And if you think you can use you know, a component set maybe twice or maybe three times or maybe more than that, then there's got to be impact in terms of obviously saving materials, upcycling, recycling and um, you know using it in probably different building typologies or build environment context um, but in essence you know adaptive reuse in buildings is great but there will be an end to the life cycle of that building one way or the other uh, at least in, in commercial developments and then the question is is that really the end of a life cycle do we still think about demolition clearly not we think about you know re-engineering we think about demountable structures we think about and we're part of that the the you know the platform approach the platform design program that's run by the mtc which is all about again just creating interfaces between different different systems within structures but it's got to have an impact on the value system and that's quite interesting because suddenly back to the idea of incentivizing and creating new markets you, you're not comparing apples to apples anymore you're not saying if i buy that stuff over here, it's going to be the same as buying it over here. If you can introduce reuse as an integral part of the offer, then the value system has to follow that. And it's it's a very exciting time to think about this and say, what if a building exists five times in different shape or form and maybe in different locations? Because the material can can do it. We know that, um, but we haven't we haven't quite figured out how we do it as a as a society or you know as as a as a mixed bag of stakeholders i want to um pick up in a minute on a couple of other questions that people have asked but um first um matt andrew did you have anything you wanted to um enter at the moment hmm, yeah i was just going to men mention on, on this this value thing because I, I i i work mainly around the around the, the cement industry and I, I find that it with low carbon cements, it helps if there's also a, and it, the, the, it's the overall value proposition of what was said earlier. You know, if you have a, a low carbon cement, but it's also quicker to clean the the, the molds and the mixes afterwards, you need, use less pigment in, in, in it, perhaps fewer shrinkage joints in the, in the finished structure. You know, it's that whole value proposition that gives the whole thing a shove and you almost end up with the, the low carbon cement as a, you know, as a, a pleasant extra, but um, if you see what I mean, <laughs> it's value that's the thing, like the value of the whole proposition. Yeah. Matt? I, I just wanted to echo a point that Alison made actually about the emotion piece versus data. And we can see that um, uh, quite a few natural materials, which are perfectly good, are now stopped being used because of the, the, the consideration of fire retardants versus you know artificially made materials. In the in the light of Grenfell, and I think that this is a really important point where we could be driving ourselves down a more carbon intensive route by looking at some of these, you know, very emotive subjects, which people say we're not going to go down that route because it is a riskier route, and we're not relying on the data. I think it's a really important point that Alison made there. Thanks. Okay, um, I'm going to try and wrap together. Um, three questions that have, that have come in for the audience and I'll, I'll give a first answer and then a um, hands up for anybody else who wants to have a, have a go at an ad. And then they're, 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 they're individually, they're more specific questions, but uh, they build into something larger. So um, Bertie's asked about 
um, support for innovation to try and um, make use of, of, of all bio-based materials. Um, Ellie was asking about waste for reuse as part of the circular economy. Um, and Duncan was kind of going the other way and saying, um, where's the space for bringing in completely new materials? Now, I think this is where um, UKRI, Innovate UK, making use of challenge-like initiatives, shall we say, um, really helps rather than um, perhaps some of the, the traditional ways of working of saying, well, we want, we want to do um, some innovation exactly on, on some, some kind of energy technology or some kind of material, um, whatever it may be, and have, the, have these wider challenges um, with the scope to say, we are really looking for whatever will address this challenge. Yeah. So certainly in terms of transforming foundation industries, we have funded projects that are definitely looking to reuse old materials, um, everything from textiles through biomaterials, reuse of construction demolition, you know, all, all, all of that has featured as part of projects um, we've funded. And indeed, um, why, why wastes from within the sectors themselves and, and, and wider wastes have, have come more and more to the fore. I mean, we, we started out simplistically with a focus on energy efficiency and resource efficiency. And frankly, what we found over two and a half years is that because we are able to support projects in that space, now we are getting a flood of people going, I've been wanting to do this for ages, you know, but there's ne I've never been able to fit one of the previous silos. Yeah, so I think it's really important on, on, on a wider space, so, as well as, I would say, um, Duncan, um, allowing the use of new materials. Sometimes that's been completely new, um, and sometimes it's the piece about bringing new materials in alongside or becoming part of what we call traditional materials. So you're not going to be surprised that, that we've been funding some things along the line of, okay, graphene into cement and, and therefore into concrete and, and things, things like that also form part of um, our scope. So I'd probably like to ask Matt to comment on that first and see how much of that perhaps came through just from construction, but then to hear from the rest of the panel before we finish. Matt? Yeah, I mean, I think, so, Transformer construction was more looking at the process rather than the materials that are sort of going into into a construction uh, project. We didn't. Um, so, for example, you know, we will fund uh, we, we funded projects that look at concrete, you know, and 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 and, and that's that's perfectly perfectly okay because it's looking at um, ensuring that the those because it's it's the transition, isn't it, between if we're looking at materials, then it's almost like that, you know, there is a route towards getting to more sustainable materials and different materials. In construction, there is a very long process of getting those materials, you know, checked and validated and insured and all that kind of, uh, and all that kind of piece. It's not necessarily an easy route. So what we have looked at is saying that, okay, um, what do we have at the moment? Uh, let's minimize the use of that let's uh, in, increasingly tag and understand where those materials are going so they can be reclaimed i think this is a really important point to saying that we don't necessarily know historically if you use steel what type of steel it is because not all steel is equal and whereabouts in the building it is so at some point how can it be reclaimed so we're looking at that piece of the process. There are projects like uh, Michael and the, the Hyperpile project, for example, that was look, were looking at uh, new materials. We have also been looking at uh, combinations of materials where you've got new mineral foam, injectable mineral foam, um, working with light gauge steel, for example, which can substitute uh, concrete for uh, flooring in, in buildings up to, up to 10 stories. So I think it's a, it's a case of um, sort of you know, playing tunes with what you have, because the other challenge you have, and this is the, the supply chain piece, is that, you know, we have worked with a cohort of really, really forward thinking organizations who want to grasp and engage with this. There is throughout the industry a permafrost of people who don't want to know. 
or have always done it in a certain way. And getting through that permafrost is really difficult. So this is where, you know, looking at the value piece and saying, okay, this, this is not lowest cost, but it has all these additional benefits. Getting through that permafrost of I don't want to know is a real challenge. And that's where some of these innovative materials and some of these processes are, uh, are, are kind of slowing down on that momentum. Can I jump in there? Because permafrost is a word that I use quite a lot to describe some of the bits of the industry. And I don't think that is as simple as saying organizations are part of that permafrost. I think there are individuals within organizations that are part of that permafrost. And this is a culture issue. This is about creating a culture of an industry that wants to deliver better outcomes and do things better rather than do things as they've always done them. And it's it is really difficult and it's not as simple as saying, oh, well, they'll all retire soon and it'll be fine and we'll have this really innovative industry. I don't think that's going to be, I don't think that's actually going to happen. I used to think that might happen, but it's not, it, that's not going to be the case. I think we've got to find ways through um, client leadership and through leadership within businesses to make it unacceptable to not embrace these better ways of working and not to deliver those values. And I think that come, you know, for example, why are organizations still procuring businesses that haven't got the right policies and procedures, et cetera, in place? Why, you know, why are innovative companies that are doing the right things, that are investing in R&D, that are delivering, you know, against net zero approaches, why are they up against somebody who's just going to deliver a low cost solution, not have the right focus on their um, health and well-being of their employees, that they're not doing things well. There's a whole raft of organizations that are just lifestyle businesses within construction. And they're taking work away from organizations that are doing the right things and investing in innovation. And we need to change the culture right from the clients and just remove that ability to not do things correctly. And once we've done that, I think we can start to push the boundaries and quality on innovation. All of this stuff is interconnected, but it really is a culture piece and just finding ways to make it unacceptable to not do these right, th to do these right things. Can I, can I add to that? because it's, it's very close to, I think, uh, what we experience here. And there's, there's a few things um, on that point. The, the first is, I think we need accountability and accountability needs to be, again, measured against something that is consistent. There's, there's too many situations in the industry where promises are being made. It's, it's not quite monitored whether or not those promises are kept. And if they're kept, if they're kept to the degree that they were uh, committed to. And the second then is on that on that note is that it starts with commitment. And so one example, I'll, I'll get back to the bio-based materials in just a second, but um, we made a commitment here as a business to use um, low carbon materials and try to swap concrete to the largest degree possible. Now, one of the things that I think has to be acknowledged and is not widely acknowledged enough is that if we look for sustainable solutions, uh, be it the, the you know, passive or hybrid operation of a building or be it the embodied carbon content in materials that serve that building. It's not going to be a one-to-one -one swap. If I want a, a, a passive building, it's not going to have the properties of a fully actively run building. And we have to compromise somewhere. That doesn't mean lack of quality, but it means a different way of thinking about it. And the same is true for materials, I think. And when, when we couldn't source what we wanted to source. We, we looked around the globe, we brought in Wagner's from Australia, we started using earth friendly mm -hmm. concrete, and that was a commitment that was made. And of course there were challenges, but the, the idea there was that um, after working with DB Group and Temfree and also talking to others, it was just a matter of understanding where is the risk profile acceptable to the clients, to the consultants, and to the supply chain. And so what I'm trying to say is that if if you start with, for instance, temporary works, 
and you're not trying to build a tower made of things that we don't quite understand yet, then that is absolutely possible. If we stop the conversation by saying, well, I don't understand the material, so we're not going to use it, then it's not a very productive conversation because you haven't really fully appreciated that there is low risk applications. You know, if you're walking on a paver in a new train station, it's, it's not walking on a slab in a 50 story tower. And you can use different materials. You can probably finish them differently. You can, you know, think of other ways of reinforcing slabs by looking at fiber mixes of, of clever new fibers that exist and, and all sorts of others. Um, but we could only do that also because we had a right network of academic partners. We did testing with BRE. We did testing with some of the civil slabs at Dundee and uh, here at City University. And so again, it's about just trusting that, making the commitment and then following through. And the other example is um, similar in what we're currently going through at UCL where I'm challenging the colleagues to, to think, how can we produce uh, things in very sophisticated ways, but what's the point of doing that if the material processing is complex, but the, the artifact is in essence the same. So um, what we're doing there is we're looking to use carbon negative materials, so bio-based materials. And again, the understanding is we will not use them as a cladding material on day one because they will not meet the current challenges. We, we know that. Um, but there's a lot of low risk applications or for instance, fit out applications or you know, other parts of buildings or infrastructure uh, where there isn't really a reason why we wouldn't use them. And then the intelligence comes through the design and engineering process and saying, what if we cut out 50% and we do maybe something else, we eliminate manufacturing steps, which make it you know, a completely bio-based um, you know, monolithic material and so on and so forth. Use the material properties to, to the max. Then you can go away and you, you can scratch your head because you've got a real challenge now. You, you want to use a material that is just in its, in its early stages, and you want to use it in ways where you cut out, let's just say 50%. But then it's worth going away and, and having a think. And I think we, we, we need that you know, accountability, we need the commitments first, and then follow through, because we can do an awful lot, and, and it's exciting. I, I absolutely agree, Michael. I mean, the, the, the number of times where you're going to be able to go very simplistically from zero to 100% of where you want to be in one step. It's, you know, I mean, if you, if you come across one, please let me know. You know, uh, the, the, the reality is, is that, that there will be steps and often very, very many steps. And, and you're dead right. We mustn't, we must avoid uh, not doing the first step just because we think it's not, it's not going to deliver the, the final result we want. Um, at, at, I'll give you at some point in, in, in the future. Yeah. Um, now, all of a sudden, hey, presto, I can't believe where the time's gone. Time's starting to run against us. We've, we've only a few, few minutes left. Um, so I'd like to ask um, all, all the panellists um, if they do have one, or you might be able to squeeze in two if you're lucky, and um, brief key things you'd like to get across to the audience as a result of what you've seen in the report and um, the, the discussion we've had, had this morning to leave as a takeaway. Um, if you don't have one, don't worry. Yeah, it's thin, but um, I, I've, I've heard a number of things today uh, reiterated that I think are absolutely key. So I suspect between you, uh, we'll tick a number of uh, really valuable boxes. Um, any volunteer to go first? No. Nope. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, well, I'm, I'm going to take I'm going to take the easy one then, but yeah, as, as 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 chair, because absolutely all of you and indeed myself have, have said uh, that, that the collaboration um, is, is is key uh, to, to to much of this. Um, we continue to see from 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 my seat that so many things only become achievable when you've got access. To people and companies and ideas outside of the box and the silo that you sat in, perhaps for decades, uh, in, in terms of certain, certain industries, to give you a chance uh, of, of making the steps forward on sustainability that we need. Um, you know, it's that classic of 
you only know a few percent of what's out there unless you talk to others and collaborate with them. You're never going to really know um, what, what, the, what the potential is and how far and how fast you can move forward. And I genuinely think that the collaboration process, although it can be hard at the beginning, significantly increases the pace at which you can bring through uh, new innovations in the sustainability space. And that, that's my takeaway. Um, Alison? I think building on that collaboration point, we need to have the cultures in place to enable that collaboration to happen effectively and for people to change their mindsets and become more willing to change. And aligned to that, we need the commercial environment to be in place to make it feasible to collaborate and also um, to support those ways of working that will enable these innovations to really fly within the market. Yeah, I think it's all about, uh, it's about share, it's collaboration, it's sharing the, the risks and the rewards and really you know, the parties involved really wanting it to, to work, you know, really buying into to innovations and the, and the process. And I think these collaborative projects like uh, UKRI funds, the smart awards and so on. It's not so much about the money, it is the, it's the getting together around the focus of a project. And yeah, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to build on those two comments. And there, there's, you know, back to this point of dissemination, and it's really sessions like today, where I think we all take something away, we, we learn something, we hear about what people are doing, we can grow our network. And so that learning, I think, increases awareness. And I think everybody here has an interest in all of this, which is a good starting point. But, you know, I wasn't certainly aware of some of the things that were mentioned, and I'm, you know, going to be eager to look some of it up. But it's also been clear, you know, what are we working towards? What are the, the goals? What are short, mid and longer term goals? And how can we achieve them to have targeted output and, and real, real world input and impact? And there's two things that come to mind for me. Uh, one is the time scales, as we discussed, and the other is, um, you know, what what are the degrees of innovation we're working towards? Everybody's dreaming of the disruptive and the breakthrough, um, which can be technically very advanced, or they can be commercially very very savvy and clever. Um, but I think what we really need is more more well orchestrated, sustaining innovation to to you know. To go after the five percent improvement on every project that we do and maybe the 20 percent on every building that we do and so that there is a real understanding of incremental improvements that are structured and not the lucky shot um, you know where where we just got it right for once and so that that i think back to the point of culture is just something we got to cultivate that the idea that we improve consistently and constantly is just in the bloodstream and it's exciting when you get to the point you're just constantly looking, how can we do this better? How can I talk to to, to collaborate and all these things? Um, and yeah, then we just we just get to a different way of working altogether. Um, yeah, so to, from my point, I think really briefly, it's just, it's looking beyond cost and getting to that value piece, really. And then if we start looking at the value that an asset can generate, um in many different aspects and these other pieces will start to fall into place and it's it is i appreciate somewhat of an opaque subject what is value but there's so many resources out there i mean we've mentioned it several times the value toolkit from the cih from construction innovation hub um there's the you know the, the construction playbook that has been uh, produced by hn government and you know transforming construction has got a huge amount of resources if you just search for transformer construction challenge we've got a huge amount of resources from all the projects that we've done you know they've been mentioned here today uh helping just to change that mindset from cost moving away from cost and delivering on value bruce i think your microphone has broken <laughs> sorry no I, I last minute i failed muted because something was going off in the background um but that's a that's a great point to which to finish um matt um a couple of people have been asking about uh where we can find copies of the report um 
I'm trying to remember, Andrew, is, is it available publicly on any anywhere yet or are we releasing it after today? That's what I've forgotten. Yeah, I think the plan the plan is to release it probably via UKRI, but we're still... Okay, all right. So, so, so for those in the audience who uh, are after a copy, um, please either um, go to the UKRI website and um, look for um, Transforming Foundation Industries and you'll find it there or you'll find a contact with myself or one of the team or the um, Innovate, U Innovate UK, uh, sorry, the KTN team um, who are materials who are also leading on, on this for us and we'll get that available as fast as we can. Um, and what just remains for me to wrap up and thank all the panellists um, for your contributions today. It's been a fascinating discussion. And as I think I said at the beginning, we've only really scratched the surface of, of the level of things that we need to do and address in this space. Um, but what I'm sure we'll all keep fighting the good fight uh, and take everything forward as fast as we can. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>